Well, today it's another installment in my garden design series that I have been doing over the course of this growing season. And today it's gonna to be all about focal points. But before I do a deep dive into that, I wanna give everybody, members, a shout out. Stuart, you and I had so much fun on that last live talk we did. Was that last Sunday? Yep. It was for members only. It was kind of a more intimate group. It was so much fun. Thank you guys. Thank you, thank you for participating. And so let's just let's get right into it if you want to if you want to know more about basic garden design fundamentals i talk about them in great length in my book and today and and that includes things like we talked in the past about um entry the importance of framing the view and today we're going to talk about focal point and they all kind of go hand in hand and in my book uh it, it kind of describes how they relate to one another. Now, if you cannot afford to buy my book, I certainly understand if, you, if you're on a tight budget, but a lot of libraries have it, and several of you have told me that you've checked it out of your local library. So you definitely can do that if they don't have it, request it, and they will get you a copy. So in my book, I talk about focal point and the importance of focal point and some of the fundamentals of focal point. And so what are they? Well, I think it's pretty much a non-brainer. Again, most of these design principles you guys already know. They are very intuitive and they are things that basically if you just try to put some language on it, you will be able to very easily identify and create focal points. So the next time you're looking at a garden picture, at a garden image, or you're on a garden tour, just look into the distance, whether it's near or far, and ask yourself, oh, is that an effective focal point? And try to deconstruct it. So I have a number of them, and some of them are in the front yard, some of them are in the backyard, some of them are from inside out, and some of them are almost from outside in. And probably one of the most dramatic focal points I have that, that I know Stuart loves is in the spring this large Chinese snowball viburnum which is on a direct axis Stuart if you don't mind torquing slowly it's you're gonna go towards my kitchen window it's on direct axis in other words in a straight line it's a straight shot from my kitchen window to the Chinese snowball viburnum now, did I really know that that was going to be a focal point when I planted it? No, I did not because I thought it was going to stay as a small shrub and it turned into something that was large and a small tree. I identified it as a focal point and now I can kind of design and stage things around it, arranging things to enhance its beauty when it's in bloom and even do some judicious pruning on it so that it remains a beautiful, albeit understated focal point when it is not in bloom. So the focal point I'm working on today is going to be this massive concrete urn that I can see from a number of different vantage points. I can see it from my kitchen window. It is a focal point when you come in my garden gate. It's a focal point looking from inside our studio to the outside and from almost any vantage point, it is impressive. So what do we, what do we ask out of a focal point? Well, number one, we want it to call attention to itself. Unlike some other things that we want to hide or detract our eye line from, this we definitely want to draw our eye to it. We want it to be impressive. We want it to be beautiful. It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like a visual exclamation point for a specific area. Now, I have certainly found that focal points can be temporary or they can be enduring. They can be seasonal or they can be year round. And a lot of that depends on the nature of the focal point itself. So for example, if it is really intense, profuse, dramatic seasonal color, 
Uh, in that case, then it's probably not going to be permanent because we don't have seasonal color year round. If it is some kind of statuary, uh, an expensive fountain, something that's very heavy, in that case, it's more likely to be permanent. So in this instance, while this concrete urn is a permanent focal point in my garden, if for no other reason than it, was, than it is very heavy and it was very expensive, it's a permanent feature, but the contents of it change seasonally and are not permanent. They are transitory and change with the growing season and quite frankly with, with my own whims. Stuart, let's walk this way a little bit. Let me kick my book out of the way. And I think probably the very classic example of a focal point is when it's in the center of a formal setting. So quite frequently in a park, in a, a, a very large landscape, in a vista, a stately home, you will find that there is in the middle, in a prominent place, in a formal garden, that there's a focal point. So I consider my garden to be an informal, formal garden or a formal, informal garden. And in this context, the formality of the boxwood in the potager really presents an opportunity in the central circle of boxwood for a focal point. Now, right now, I have an olive urn in there. And those of you guys who have seen my garden over the years have probably seen that focal point change. And that relates to my question of the day. If you've been following me for a while, if you would, please let me know some of the different focal points that you have seen in the center of the Potage. Now, some of them that have been there are a scarecrow, uh, climbing baby boo pumpkins up a tutor. I've had gigantic alliums. I've had a weeping uh, pussy willow. What other things have I had in there? A, a myriad of different things. Um, and they kind of just change depending on my mood, my look, and the season. Another focal point, though it's not so much in a formal context, is the dovecote birdhouse that I've got over there in the corner. It is very much a focal point, albeit it is an asymmetrical one. It's not in the middle of a symmetrical planting or a symmetrical design. You can also see that there can be layers of focal points. So if you look right through the potager, you can see that the first focal point, perhaps with a, a sideline focal point, is there is a bay tree that I've got on a plant stand there. Then there's the secondary focal point, and probably the most important one, the olive urn in the center of the box circle. But then beyond it, I have layered another focal point that is there even in the winter year round, and that's the presence of a garden bench. So often a focal point can also be utilitarian, it can be functional, it can be, but hopefully it's always beautiful, presentable, and something that we want to have as a visual hook that will entice us to look beyond and into the different kinds of complexities, textures, colors, design, and plantings in the garden. So now let's come back over here. So you can see here if these were removed, that even from this direction, this very, I can't even, I can barely budge it. This very, very heavy concrete urn that came from an estate sale is a focal point from both directions. And I love it because it's a beautiful presence even in the winter time. So typically, in the past, I have had a, a focal point that's enduring, um, at least in the winter time. So that might be some kind of conical evergreen that I can light in the winter or something of an evergreen nature. But even if I had nothing in it, as you can see, if I remove this to tour, you can see that this is beautiful even by itself. It's really lovely, I think. So, this is a combination of something that is both functional 
enduring but with a transitory flexibility that I love. Now earlier in the season, during tulip season and uh, when the temperatures weren't, weren't so extreme, in the first iteration of that, I had some tulip bulbs in here and I had this tutor in here to give it a little bit of height. So there was this beautiful uh, visual hook of spring bloom down here that was replaced later by the visual hook of some scented geraniums and some climbing geraniums. Well this again is a permanent fixture and this starts getting a whole lot of sun as the season progresses and that was no longer a practical focal point to put inside of this very beautiful urn. So when I decided, when I was deciding what I wanted to replace that with, I went through different iterations. Stuart, is, should I be on this side or the other side? Do we need to switch? No, is fine. it okay? Yeah. Okay, but I'm... Lighting-wise so, is what you were saying. Yeah, yeah lighting-wise. So let's do it from both vantage points. So, careful, don't hurt yourself. Um, okay, so <laughs> I, looked at different, I looked at different options. My first option was just another boxwood ball because I liked the rhythm and repetition of that. I could keep it in there year round and it would be an enduring presence even in the winter. But when I tried that out, I thought that just looked a little bit too home, too home, ho hum, too ho hum. And it just didn't look snappy enough to be a really effective focal point. Now I'm using that expression snappy because somebody used it in one of the comments and I adored it so much that Stuart is going to be part of my part of my my uh, verbal uh, repertoire now because I just loved it. So yes, a focal point needs to be snappy. So I tried that and I thought no, it not only looked too staid, it looked a little bit too plain and it didn't have enough movement. So then I looked at some different options, maybe another version of something that was kind of evergreen. So I looked at what I always kind of look at and that is a topiary. So I tried a Eugenia topiary in here, which I have had before. Now imagine what this would look like if it were lower and then the height would be to about here if it were actually planted. Again, it, this had a little bit more visual interest from a height standpoint and from a layer, garden layering standpoint, but it didn't have the punch that I wanted. And it still, even though it had a little bit more movement to it, it still didn't have dramatic enough movement that, it, that I, was, I was satisfied with it, both from this standpoint and especially from my kitchen window. So even though I kind of liked this, I decided I wanted something with a little bit more pizzazz. Now, as I go through these, you tell me which one you prefer because there's no right or wrong answer. There's just right or wrong subjective preferences. And I like to always take into account the totality of the garden and how a focal point plays in reference to the rest of the garden, but also does it communicate my garden style and the signature touches I like. So I vetoed this one and I have vetoed the boxwood ball. So then I thought, okay, I want something with a little bit more color and a little bit more movement and also something that might attract pollinators. So I thought I'm gonna try what is, I think, one of the most beautiful and most underused plants in our landscape. And in this case, it was a Miss Lemon Abelia. Now this is a Southern living plant. So I put it in here and first of all, I, I think it's very pretty uh, and I do like the texture of it and I like the infusion of how it captures the light. I like the glossy leaves, especially I liked it when it was in, had put out little white blooms because it was a pollinator magnet. 
but still the scale of it wasn't quite right for me. So if this was three times as large, I might have really liked it, but this scale was smaller and a plant that was three times as large, I wouldn't have been able to fit the root ball in there. So even though I loved this as an option, nevertheless, I didn't want to go out and buy a larger version of it and it still wasn't quite satisfactory. So even though this might be an option for the future in some regard, right now it is not. Okay, so that was my third choice. Then I started thinking outside the box a little bit. One shape, line, and form that I am wanting to introduce more into my garden because it kind of speaks a little bit more to a native look, a little bit more to an Oklahoma vernacular, and it definitely has more movement, and that is strappy thin foliage. And I especially like it in the heat of the summer because it still captures movement and imagination, and it looks presentable and gorgeous even when it's not in bloom and there's not a profusion of color. So what I ultimately, de ultimately decided on, which is why this is already kind of form fitting into this pot, what I ultimately, de ultimately decided on was a Lamandra. Now this is a Platinum Beauty Lamandra. It is in the Southern Living Plant Collection. I have a little bit of grooming still to do on it. Um, but I love the way it has more height, it has movement, especially when the wind blows through it. Even when it's not a windy day, it gives the illusion of movement. It, rep it is singularly effective because I don't have a lot of this plant leaf form in my garden, so it stands out in contrast beautifully and very effectively to the boxwood balls, to the size and scale of the oak leaves that are behind it, and I just love the way it looks. It also, at this specific point in the landscape, the way the light falls in the evening, it captures the evening sun just beautifully, and you can see right now it captures the morning sun. I love the way it looks. And I also, Stuart, if you don't mind looking at it from the other perspective now, as if you were looking out of my kitchen window, you can see how beautiful it is. And I love the way it looks as you enter my back gate. So, hopefully that kind of communicates to you my rationale for the focal point that I selected for this container based on my own garden style, my own garden objectives, and really what I wanted to infuse into my garden, taking into account certain givens, how hot it is, the time of year, the fact that the container is permanent, and also the things that are growing around it. So Stuart, if, if you were me, which one of these things would you end it up with? I like that one. You do like this one? Yeah, I one. do like that one. Okay, again, there's not a right or wrong answer. There is just what you have more preference for than the other. The other thing that I, I love about this is that it's got white striations in this. Well, it's, and it's dramatic. It's dramatic, it is. It's, it's, it's got a vertical, it, it serves as an exclamation point, very much so. I think it does have movement. I like the angularity of it. I like the fact that it, again, it introduces um, a shape and a form that heretofore I didn't have in, in, my, in my landscape. But I also love it because it does two things simultaneously. It kind of is green, but it also reads as almost white and particularly in contrast to the evergreens around it. And it's bicolored, so it can kind of swing both ways, almost also looking kind of gray. But the other reason I love it is, Stuart, if you could come right here and kind of get low and look in the distance, you can see how it enhances the blooms on that white wedding hydrangea. And also what I've got yeah, planted in, in that, that pot, yeah, yeah. the variegation of that. 
So it provides very, very great layering. Now, again, I will do some more zhuzhing on this. It needs a little bit of grooming. And you'll notice, here's, here is um, a tip. The base of this tutor, which I got at Gardener Supply years ago, this has another, another layer. And I tried it with this tutor in place, and I thought, no, that looks too fussy, and it detracts from really some other focal points in my garden, which are more subtle, and that's the chairs in the distance, which also serve as focal points. But I left the bottom rung in because I could pull, and I haven't pulled all of them through because I wanted you to be able to see. I pulled through a lot of the blades make them poke out the top. to make them poke out the top and stand up and fly right to give me the verticality that I wanted and more of the form that I wanted. So again, I've got a little bit more pruning and grooming to do around the base, but I love the way this looks. Now, it is not enduring because this is not frost hardy, but if I so chose, I could definitely bring this into the greenhouse and I could just plop it back in place and have immediate impact and immediate drama in the spring without waiting for any bulbs or anything of that nature to come into bloom. But I also love it because it doesn't have color because albeit there's not a lot of color right now on the opposite side because last week it was so hot that most of the geraniums and things came out of bloom. But typically in more, um, in more amenable weather, there's lots of color over here. And if I had color over here and I had color over here, it would reduce the impact of both of them. This way, it really kind of draws, the way it cascades, it draws its eyes over to this side, which is in its assemblage and in its congregation of all these pots is a focal point in its own right. So, Stuart, have I expressed and communicated well enough an explanation for layering focal points? Absolutely. Okay, is there, do you have, as somebody who is not a gardener, do you have any questions about this garden design principle? Well, it's, I'll make a small point if I can make it quick enough, and that's that it's very similar to the way you edit video. You edit video to direct the eye where you want the eye to go. Right. So you would leave, like, if you have the, a person on one side of the frame, the next shot should have something in that same side of the frame where their eyes already are, or stuff like that. Okay. So it's very similar yeah. to the way you direct the eye. Yeah, and, it, and it's, it's common sense. The other thing is that typically, I think it's important, and I didn't even mention this in the book, and I should have, typically I think a focal point to be its most impactful needs to have some negative space around it. So if this were in a border and it was filled with all sorts of other kinds of grasses and tall and blooming perennials, it wouldn't be as impactful a focal point. But here it's very dramatic because there is this negative space around it which shines a spotlight onto the plant itself and doesn't detract from the beauty of what I've got planted here. So in essence, that is, um, that is just a little primer on the use of focal points. If you come over here, you can see that um, in a way, here is these pots here are a very layered focal point. Um, and then let's close Stuart here with two different examples of, of garden principles. So I have simultaneously, okay, if you could back up just a little bit more, okay, I have simultaneously, sorry Stuart, I have created an entrance into the lawn area by the positioning of some of my plantings and the fact that the contours of the garden are expansive and then they narrow so they draw your eye. You feel as if this is kind of a portal that you're coming into because I have framed the view with the arch of these tree branches. So I have then framed the view, I've created a beautiful entrance and in the distance I now have 
to draw your attention a beautiful visual hook, which is uh, an effective focal point. So you guys give me examples of focal points you've created in your own gardens and your, your ideas about layering focal points, because I think that I think it just creates a signature look and it's one of the reasons in that one image that I showed in the community tab of what my garden looked like way back when before there was anything here and what it looks like now is because of effective layering and that includes layering your focal points. So I hope you enjoyed this little garden design primer and lesson for today. Well, if you've held on this long, here is my fashion epilogue and my outfit du jour from top to bottom. This is another pair of those lightweight wood earrings that I got um, online. They're so inexpensive. Stuart, we definitely need to put a link to these because these are just great. They'll be wonderful for stocking stuffers at Christmas. You can kind of divide them up. My top, you guys have probably seen before, though this is the first time I've worn it. I got this at Goodwill. Uh, gosh, I can't remember when we did that thrifted video, Stuart. It's been a while ago. Here's a question of the day I had fashion wise though. I pulled this out and I thought, oh, do I need to iron it? And then I thought, no, I kind of like, even with cotton sometimes, an unironed natural look during the summertime. I think it looks kind of fresh and cool like you just took it off of the clothesline rather than more pressed and more tailored like I like to be in the fall. This is a little bit more cash. So let me know, that's my fashion question of the day. Um, my belt, I think I got at Target. I've been wearing it a lot recently. My britches are, oh, and I I love them because I've got pocket. They definitely fall into that thematic for this year, which is loose and cool with pockets. I got these at one of my favorite little boutiques, Eden in the Paseo. My shoes came from Nordstrom Rack. My bracelet I have had forever and ever. I don't, I, I got it in my early 20s. I don't remember how long I've had it. My ring, which I adore, belonged to my mother-in-law. Um, Stuart, have I forgotten anything? Okay, so there you go. There is my outfit du jour.